Hey guys, welcome back to No Tucks Allowed. And uh, for this uh, episode, we need a moment of silence. That's about all the silence you're going to get. <laughs> just to let you know. But in the meantime, to help me praise <laughs> our one second moment of silence, I have this wonderful guy with me today. Uh, he goes by the name of Big Pod because I can't pronounce it, pronounce like his actual name. Uh, although I think I might be able to pronounce it like his first name, if that's even what they call it in Slovenian. But yes. hey. Oh, okay. Well, how's it going, Big Pod? Uh, hello, this is Primoz, a.k.a. Big Pod, and I'm doing just fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to hear. All right, Big Pod, breaking news. As of uh, September 3rd, 2024. While we're recording this on the 5th of 2024. <laughs> breaking news. <laughs> yeah, breaking Two news. Two weeks ago. Yep. Uh, anyways, uh, Yubico has published a security advisory for their Infineon uh, cryptography library, which involves their YubiKey 5 series and, and like a couple of their other products. Yeah. And... If you are to exploit this, first of all, why are you taking the time to exploit it? Because all the money that you used to do this exploit, you could have just bought yourself something nice anyway. Yeah. Yeah, but Big Pod, I... Also, you could have use it. to access the account. You need yeah. to exploit this to access the account. That's This is also true. Which Hey, Big Pod, you actually have these UB keys. You use them yourself. Yep. I've never yep. touched these things. So, uh, maybe you can explain this? <laughs> First of all, this is a YubiKeys, are a, or you can get one of the other, one other similar options on the market, like I believe Google has Titan keys. They mostly work the same way, they're FIDO2 uh, web art uh, tokens, but they're an amazing tool to have in your security tool belt. And, well, just to begin with, Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> it's actually not their library. They're just library they use. It is made by the Infineon company that also has, uh, also makes chips, which are in these YubiKeys. And yes, it has a vulnerability, <clears throat> which you can exploit by getting a hold of the YubiKey. This is from what I read. So I could be wrong, but you need to get a hold of the YubiKey. You don't need to get a hold of user's username and password and their YubiKey pin code. So everything you need to access their account anyway. So <laughs> where's the exploit? The exploit is that you can duplicate the key. <clears throat> Something that shouldn't be possible. Ah. Okay. Yeah, these are meant to be one-off tokens. Problem is you can duplicate it, which means you could, in theory, put it back in its place and the owner would be no wiser. Okay, so I know that on other shows, they always said that if you ever buy a YubiKey, you should always buy a second one, just in that way you have a backup. Yes. So using this exploit, does that mean that if I make use of this exploit, I only have to buy one YubiKey because those things are not exactly like pocket change. They're no, just above it. That doesn't mean that. Oh, okay. I just I just wanted to check just to see if like maybe <clears throat> I could use this to my advantage and be a cheap bastard. No, because you still need the access to YubiKey and you still need to make something that like looks like or acts like a YubiKey anyway. The problem is with this exploit is that it's really only useful if you want if you are trying to steal the YubiKey, but also try to make your target not aware that YubiKey was ever stolen. From my understanding, that's the only useful attack vector that this exploit provides. But this could change the future. That's true. Like the longer that this, now that this is a known quantity, and uh, I know that the products like the YubiKey are growing in popularity. Yeah. Uh, so, they, uh, they are now used as pass keys, which is a replacement for passwords. So instead of using username, password, and a second factor of YubiKey, now you have yeah, a username. So you just 
and a single factor of pa of YubiKey, which I think it's great, but still, this could yeah. be used as an exploit to get into your account. But it's also important to know that in most cases, your YubiKey can be secured with a password. So every time you plug in the YubiKey, you have to enter this password or, or what is called a pin code, even though it can enter any characters you want, not just numbers. The problem with this exploit in the broad strokes is that it's unfixable. Hmm. Because yeah. there is no way to update the firmware, at least that the public is aware of. Which suggests that you cannot fix this firmware and cannot fix this vulnerability. Therefore, if they wanted to uh, do anything about it, they would have to ship new YubiKeys. And there is a lot of YubiKey uh, Series 5 out in the wild right now. Yeah, I don't think that's like their latest one, but it's like uh, not exactly their oldest one either, is it? I, will, I believe it's like uh, like for like a couple of years now they've been selling YubiKeys 5. I mean, they still have the UB, the YubiKey 5 on their website. Yeah, yeah, but... There might this might actually be their current model. Let me see. Uh, yeah, I guess it is their current model. Yeah, it is their current model. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yes, uh, this is it. This is an issue. Now, uh, I want to go into like the logic as to why I've never actually dealt with these things myself, right? Yeah. Uh, when when I'm logging into, so, uh, I have a laptop here. Uh, this one's a Pinebook Pro. Uh, we'll we'll talk about this on, on a later episode using what what the what the Pinebook Pro Pro is like, but uh, I don't keep anything confidential on a portable device. So like this this Pinebook Pro doesn't have anything besides like my D and D notes. Uh, the other like general purpose laptop doesn't has like an SSH key that doesn't have access to anything, and then so. And then I understand that like uh, these pass keys are very smart devices and or well like very very handy devices, but it's just like I'm not dealing with anything right now that demands like that extra step of security of like the physical key that I personally think is of of a benefit to me. Do you now, use two factor authentication? I do make use of two factor authentication. Yeah, it's it's a replacement for that. It's a replacement for the app on your phone, essentially. Yes. And That's I understand the point that. of it. It's a slightly more secure version of that. Yeah. And the reason, and it's and then, honestly more handy. But the new trend of pass keys, honestly, it's great. I, I don't do it for increased security. I do it because it's freaking far more, more easier to do. I, I literally plug in my username. I, I put the YubiKey in, press the login with pass key, and just, and just contact it to let it know that I am actually in front of the computer and that's it. I mean, maybe maybe I just need to get one just that way I can <clears> see <throat> the light behind it because uh, I'm also not really the kind of person that when I'm actually in my house, I don't carry my car keys with me. Yeah, I don't either. I have, <laughs> and, honestly, I have Yubi keys uh, basically in my in one of my bags all yeah, the time. Yeah, and I don't even carry a bag with me. So it's just well, like, I, if I would just get the YubiKey, I'd just plug into the USB port on the computer and just never unplug it. Yeah. Which I know you're not supposed to do. I do it because like, I carry my bag around outside. Yeah. Almost all the time. So that's where I actually more care about YubiKey. Because laptop, I am, I do not do remember me. Exactly for that reason. For security. Yeah. So I log in with that. When I need it on my desktop, I can fish it out of the bag. Yeah, well, I also don't really go anywhere where it's just like I can take the bag with me too. Because uh, realistically, in, in like my average day, I just tra I just transport myself between house, work, and the grocery store. Well, I don't really I, go anywhere. I don't say I say you go like every day. I I. I yeah. ride my bike. That's where I have my bag with me. So and I have also have my laptop with me, so I can do some stuff while sitting somewhere else. I also like if I go to the city for more than like shopping, 
I'll bring my laptop and my bag with me. Even if I don't bring my laptop, honestly. Yeah. And if I go to the capital, of course, I'm going to bring my uh, bag with me and laptop and everything because, well, I'm going to be there the whole day. Might as well. Bring a camera with you, too. Re- re- That's why I have content. a phone. That's why I have yeah. my phone. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> that'll, be, that'll be interesting by the end of the month. Let's not let's not yet spoil the surprise. Yeah, but anyways, uh, if if you do, if you make use of one of these uh, UB keys, uh, just just <coughs> let it. Uh, just try to sell me on it too, because like, uh, I guess I have to get one. Uh, yep. And you know, just uh, see if I can live with it, because uh, there there have been like these things where it's just like, uh, it took me a while to get on like the password manager train. Because it's just like, now I have to make sure that, like, this thing is installed on, like, all right, this extension is installed on my web browser. That way, you know, I could just hit, like, the key bind to put in my password. And it's like, oh, my goodness. And now I, and because, you know, I, I, I just did, like, the autofill password thing on, like, the the web browser. (laughs) Which, it worked. Was it smart? Probably not. Because now my, because I don't know the security of like the Mozilla account or the Google account. <laughs> uh, one thing I would advise our listeners, like this is my personal thinking, so do not take it as gospel. Do not worry about this vulnerability when it comes to your YubiKey. I don't think it's exploitable in real world. I've heard from some other people who also think the same thing so honestly I, w- I would before buying a new one i would wait for if the story ev- evolves even more but i'm i'm already been thinking about buying a couple more so i might just do that just because or i might yeah. not i don't know depending on how i feel Honestly. Yeah, I, w- I wouldn't be in too much of a rush anyway because it's it's just like simple physical security practices. It's just like if uh, you don't want if you don't want them to uh, make use of the exploit, make sure that you don't hand your Yubi key off to random people. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> all you have to do. <laughs> yeah, keep it on your person and you don't have a problem because, as far as I understand, you, you need to have access to Yubi key itself. Yeah, you need the YubiKey, you need, like, uh, the, the pin code, and then you need, like, some specialized device that can actually, all right, that can yeah. that can clone the, the, the YubiKey, you know, right, writing on the, on the firmware. It's probably just, like, a serial, uh, just a serial connector or something like that. I'm but, not sure if it's that easy. But yeah. something to that effect, like, like a proper uh, connector, like, like a proper thing that you do each pin on that that chip it's quite a probably involved setup that that would would get quite expensive for honestly not that much benefit to be told because yeah. other ways of fishing a cl- fishing a target were way better <laughs> but anyways it, it this does have a cvss severity metric of 4.9 because of this so it it is, it is it is an issue, and it is like but, what uh, yellow? Would it be in yellow? I think. I mean, CVE is in progress, so uh, yeah. I think four point nine four point nine is green. It's not even yellow yet. Oh oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think five about five and above is yellow. Yeah, that would make more sense. Yeah, so o- also they know it's not that that problematic. Yeah, the, the important part is that they let us know that this can happen. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's better than some of these security companies will, will ever tell you. Yeah. But, yeah, like, this is an evolving situation, like everything in security is. So, if if any anything uh, new happens in, in this case, we will let you know on this podcast. So, keep listening and we'll let you know. We kind of turned ourselves into a security podcast, apparently. <laughs> uh, apparently, we we talk about this often enough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but probably because uh, we, we, by the time you and I are talking about it, nobody else has yet. <laughs> yeah, 
and then we record a week after him, and everybody's just like, oh, yeah, we know everything about this now. All right, oh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, j- for the record, we pre-record. <laughs> yeah. A uh, right. week in advance. So, breaking news last week. Yep. So, Big Pod. Yeah. You you uh got your Mastodon instance back up and running. Yes, I did. In it's fact, now... uh, you and you and I were exchanging messages. Yeah. So we even verified that it worked. Yes, it did. So So what happened? I got it back up and running. I said I was this close to do it and I did it. Oh, all right. I just, all uh, I had to do was just do it. <clears throat> Yeah. So, uh, can you explain in like detail for our audience? Because uh, you know, I, I I'm also kind of curious on what it takes to actually run Mastodon. I know that you have a very, very, uh, you have a more complicated system than what like I would personally want to set up. But I'm, I, I'm always open to like hearing how people are are setting this stuff up. So first of all, you can find me on the new instance of Mastodon v two because mastodon.bigpod.se is still a thing because I couldn't delete it, even though it doesn't exist. Welcome to to Federation. It's weird. Yay. Uh, but, <clears throat> yeah. So I'm using Kubernetes. So this already brought me some pain, which I solved the last time I had it. And this time it was pretty easy. I already have manifest, so it would be... I'm using kubectl uh, for control of it. So uh, I had kubectl manifest written as YAML files, already written up in, on my laptop. And all I had to do was plug in the right values for S3 backend, for the database, and for the Redis cache, which is what all three things you need. You technically do not need the S3 storage, but it's preferred because, you know, storage gets expensive and comparably to S3, it gets very expensive. Especially with the provider I'm using, which which is quite nice when it comes to storage and bandwidth costs. So, to get Mastodon installed, you have quite a, quite a bit of components. So, you have components like Sidekick. So Sidekick has concept of, uh, let's say, tasks and queues. So uh, first of all, let, let's clear this up. Mastodon, as was discussed before, is written in Ruby. Uh, like 10 episodes back when I was complaining about Mastodon. Now we have, now the refresher, it's written in Ruby, which means it has access to this, honestly, a great tool called Sidekick. It's ex- essentially a task runner based on queues. And you have, I believe, six queues, which uh, run six tasks. And to not uh, lie about it, I'm gonna go and open method of documentation on what they are, because I really don't wanna lie to you or say anything that would be wrong I... well uh, th- I think I thank you for trying to be accurate about this okay and to correct myself I don't have to because it's actually six so you have uh, Q default which runs basically all local tasks <clears throat> that, that affect local users there are many tasks inside for the uh, that are a part of that queue. You have queue called push, which delivers payloads to other servers. So <clears throat> when you are, when you're, let's say, doing some sort of sending message to other queue or to other server, or I don't know, writing a response, it will send to that server, you've written a response or written that message and so on. Then you have ingress, which is incoming remote activities, which is low priority. Uh, basically, it pulls in posts that are <clears throat> that are uh, already published, like for example, of people you follow and stuff like that. But th- but those aren't very high priority tasks for for something like uh, 
Mastodon because they care about local using experience first. Kinda. Better that it works local than nothing, basically. Mm -hmm. Then you have mailers. This is basically, sorry, delivery of mail. So whether you have, I don't know, uh, email you have to send to the user, like a password reset and stuff like that. And then you have poll, which is low, even lower priority task than ingress. And it mostly goes for imports, backups, resolutions, deleting users, forwarding replies, and so on. And then finally, this is the one I hate the most. This is scheduler, scheduler, whatever you want to call it. This one I fucking hate. It's handling cron jobs, refreshing trending tags, and so on. And it is very, very well written. You may run as many psychic processes as you want, but do not run more than one scheduler queue because as, as a process, because you're gonna fuck everything up. That's what I did one time. <laughs> it wasn't fun. <clears throat> I can imagine. So these six queues are they're one component. So you can you can run them in a single process, single sidekick process, or you can run them in separate processes. For my deployment, because I like overkill, and I think overkill is very underrated, I for each separate uh, each separate queue, I created their own process. And actually, for some queues, I have two processes. Like I'm gonna have a lot of activity. Yeah, hmm. right. <laughs> for single user instance. <laughs> yeah, and I have a bit of a bit of like, I have uh, I have two for push pull, ingress, and default. And one for mailers and one for, of course, scheduler. And then you have a thing called streaming, which is essentially streaming API where you pull different information from server onto the client so, so you can like see your... them on when you browse. Yeah, so like your client to, to server communication. So like yes. your web browser talking with like the Mastodon server going like, hey, uh, I've got this stream of activity coming in or hey, I'm currently typing here. Yes. And, and stuff like that. That's basically that's basically what that handles. And this is written in Node.js. Which makes sense. Kind of. Not really. Kind of. Yeah. This would, this would make sense to be written in Ruby, but it ain't. It's more sense. I don't think... All of this would have been, should have been written in a, in a more sane language like, I don't uh, know. Python? Python, maybe, or Java, even, or Rust, C, C Sharp. Anything more saner than Ruby, essentially. Mm -hmm. And anything is saner than Ruby besides JavaScript. And then, of course, you have the web, which is essentially the front end. <clears throat> and it isn't written in JavaScript. It's, it, it has JavaScript component, but mainly it's, it's Puma, which is uh, Rust's web server. Not Rust, Ruby's web server, of, of course. Okay. So these are the main components. But then you also need to tell it like different information. You need to store the certain stuff. Again, you need, you need a database, which is Postgres. And if you have a lot of users, you need repl repl replicated Postgres because you need a lot of connections and Postgres doesn't like more than 1000 uh, connections. So you need a bouncer, which can get uh, involved. I don't need a bouncer. I don't have that many connections. Don't worry. Then you also need the Redis, which you also need to potentially replicate across multiple servers and you need a lot of RAM for it and so on. And again, as I said, you need an S3 storage because S3 storage is a sort of media cache. So anything that is like, I don't know, images, shit like that, all gets stored onto that S3 storage, which does lower the cost of your, of your bandwidth bill because technically speaking, most, most, uh, most 
SSD storages have slightly lower bandwidth bill than your VMs. So as I said, I'm using Kubernetes for that because I like Kubernetes and I have it set up. Mm -hmm. So something like you, you would probably be using Docker Compose. There are many resources for Docker Compose, but not so many for Kubernetes. One that I found didn't work, so I brought my own. Took me a while, and the second deployment went much smoother than the first one. This time, all I had to do was properly set up the version for the front end because it didn't want to at first load on the at the time version. I guess there was a bug or something, and I downgraded it severely. And just before the podcast started recording, I upgraded to the latest version. Guess what? It works. Hey. <laughs> so, do you want to know more, or do you have any questions, uh, comments, I, suggestions? I think I think we've got it basically set up. So, uh, just to remind everybody, what happened with your uh, with your old one? It was like some database error, right? So, in my old one, there was a corruption in a in one specific table in the in the Mastodon database which I couldn't fix for some reason. And without that table, Mastodon couldn't do shit. Yeah, Mastodon couldn't do anything. You could, you couldn't even export your profile, right? Yeah. But, yeah, so you couldn't export the profile, so uh, there's nothing to import. So you're basically starting from, fra- from yeah. scratch here. So uh, he can't uh, import his followers uh, because, you know, uh, he... He just doesn't have a backup of his profile that you know he he can find. He probably has one somewhere. It's just a matter of remembering Finding where it is. It. Great backup yeah. policy, sir. <laughs> yeah. But hey, uh, we we all got to sometimes you know you have the unintentional backup test, and that's when you find out that you lost something. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> At this point, but I would fine. suggest everybody to have non-unintentional backup tests. Which are, yep. which are intentional ones. And every backup should be tested, by the way. Of course, it's me so and my own thing, so I, I do things a bit more questionable. Yep. But hey, uh, out of curiosity, since you have Mastodon running right now, uh, how actually intensive is Mastodon uh, just operating for you? Like, if you're just watching, like, the global feed. Mm, not that intensive, like on my servers, not that intensive. Uh, to For everybody to understand, it is spread across f- four servers, the yeah, because whole load. You could, you're, you're using Kubernetes, so of course you've got yeah. it running like that. I spread across uh, four servers. I have three ARM nodes and one x86 node. Plus, there is a control plane, but that doesn't actually host any workloads. That is just to control things. Better for security of Kubernetes. But uh, I do have, like, as I said, three ARM nodes. And Mastodon, Mastodon is already built to work on ARM, which is great. It's hey, just, it means that's cheaper convenient. That's nodes. what that is. Yeah. yeah like, uh, the, <laughs> the images, the OCI images, the... Have they already built for, for ARM? So, and it doesn't really because Kubernetes uses by protocol and by specification stuff. I have to just specify that one image. So, Mastodon latest to to something slash Mastodon uh, uh, latest, and it if it's on x86 node. It will download the x86 version of image. If it's on ARM node, it will download ARM image. Oh, that's pretty cool. Because I think yeah. if you're trying to like uh, run like ARM containers on uh, some older versions of Docker, you actually had to manually specify the architecture. Yeah. It, you still well, have if you're to. trying to use Nox x86, you you still have to. Yeah. It okay. still errors out with the responded exact error. But, you know, at the same time, for, like, the servers that are running, like, Docker or po- or Podman or any of, like, these uh, container runtime manage- managers that are not, like, at the enterprise level, 
they they just assume you're running it on an x86 system because yeah. that's probably what, like 99% of the use case is. But uh, many, many of these uh, have been very, very welcoming to ARM and have been deploying or creating R images as part of the as part of uh, OCI manifests for quite a while now. Uh, most images I see I can find an ARM image for within the same manifest. So if I run it on ARM, I, I can do the same, I don't know, Ubuntu latest as I would do on in on x86 and it would work just fine with ARM support, which is nice. That's all I can say. All right, so uh, in in general, that's just like an overview of how Big Pot is running, uh, of how how Ma what Mastodon is, uh, sort of like under the hood and how how it actually runs. Uh, of course, because you're running it over a cluster, uh, you can't just say like it's using like this much CPU, this much RAM, can you? No, and yeah, because I, I, that I cluster you, kind of has like other things. But if you give me a moment, and by the end of the episode. I can give you a rough estimate hey. because I have certain statistics that I can check because Kubernetes is actually a enterprise level technology. Yeah, it can do these things. But hey, uh, if you if you want to take a moment and just like see if you can come that up uh, because, you know, uh, I imagine somebody out there is curious. But hey, uh, I want to talk a minute here about like uh, an application pick. Uh, because I think every now and then we should probably have like an application pick, and I know that uh, we we got some criticism because uh, we talk a lot about self-hosting on the show. I'm sorry, Big Pot and I are, are just hap happen to just be two guys with servers in our closets, we're, and and we have a podcast. Of course, we're going to be talking about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> it you already knew that when you when you came to watch the show, you should be expecting it. All right. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> yeah. But I want to be talking. So when it comes to the world of self-hosting, there's almost always universally two first things that somebody wants to do. The first thing is a NAS, a basic file server. Right? Because you, you, you're you tired of, you know, just using the USB flash drive to take a file from one computer to another. You just want to put it on the NAS, and then it's just on every single device that you plug into your network. And then, because you have the NAS, you put all your media files on it, that way you can watch movies from anywhere. But then you're just like, what if there was some way we could go next level with the media? And you discover this thing called a media server exists. Well, Plex has been popular, but uh, they've been making like the these uh, decisions lately that have been driving people away towards like this other alternative. And that alternative today is called Jellyfin. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to my screen here. And so uh, what I've got is my personal running Jellyfin right now. We're just looking at my uh, small movie collection. It's not actually big. And yes, I do actually own all these DVDs. So don't sue me, Disney. Uh, even though I don't have a whole lot of Disney films on here. There's a, there's a couple. There's a couple, all right? There's a couple. There's more Ghibli films than anything else, but I've got all these. I've got all this on DVD. But uh, I've taken the time. I've le legally obtained these, and uh, they're they're all here. And like, if I want to go over here and just like uh, start look up a movie, like it it pulls in like all the information. I could watch it, and you know, I I can go go back through. I can look at the. Uh, I've got my music on here because, you know, I like having my own self-hosted Spotify because I have a substantial music collection. It's not all on this server yet. I, I still need to get it all on this server. But, uh, you know, this server is also like the same server that I'm using for like the Home Lab series. So if you're if you're watching us on YouTube and uh, you're also subscribed to my to my YouTube channel, you're getting some early spoiler content on here uh, as for what the next episode is. And uh, this is basically what Jellyfin looks like out of the box. Uh, there's nothing, there's not a whole lot going on here. But, it can do more. So, uh, I'm logged into my administrator account, so if I go into my dashboard and I, and I go poking around in here, 
you can see that it's got stuff like live TV integration. And yeah. it can it can set up off of like a an actual tuning device. So like if you have a uh, HD home run device or just like any kind of a antenna t- antenna tuner, you can plug it. You can connect it to the antenna that you probably already have in, have on your house if you're in the American Midwest. Uh, you you can just plug it into that antenna. That antenna probably can still pick up a TV station or two, and you can just plug that into plug that into your uh, Jellyfin server. It can detect that and it can run that, or it can use an M3U tuner, which an M3U is uh, basically IP TV, and uh, th- there are IP TV providers out there. Uh, there are some that are very not legal. There are some that are, there are a lot that are questionably legal, and there are some that are actually legal. Uh, yeah. And then there are some that are so popular that uh, you think that everybody else is illegal. Yeah. Uh, I highly we, recommend finding the ones that are questionably legal because most of the time they are actually legal. <laughs> <laughs> in comparison, in Europe, a, a, a lot of uh, a lot of countries only have IPTV. Which hey, uh, I wish that IPTV was more popular in the United States, but cable lobbies. Well, <laughs> also antenna, but yeah, antenna and IPTV is currently the most popular. They, outside of like city, it's very rarely they're gonna see cable TV. But yeah, uh, anyways, uh, I'm running this over a Docker container. But if I want to just go into a at, at like a media library, I just simply go here to libraries and then just add a library and then I go tell it what kind of content I want. So like books, and then I tell tell it where my folder is. Lighted. I'm only exposing these directories to the container, so it's not going to get too much in into here. So I I won't be able to add that live. But uh, anyways, you you plug it in. Uh, as long as your your files are named named properly here uh here i'll just uh pop into uh my folder path here and we'll go into here we'll zoom in a little bit go into media uh go into tv shows so you can see where i've got all my shows broken up into these little files here so uh and then we go in uh you'll see that it filled out the metadata and it and i and because this is just like a single season season show i've got the show name listed out by the episode with the number, and then others like I believe, probably like uh, this one here. You'll see where I've got like S zero one E zero two. That's for season one episode yep. two. So you do have to come up with with a bit of a naming scheme for for the files, but. That's the kind of cost that you pay for when you when when you're self hosting is that you get to learn like proper file naming and folder structures. Who knew? <laughs> but uh, I've I've been a Jellyfin user for years. I used it for far longer than I've ever even touched Plex. Uh, before I before I I used uh, Jellyfin, I used MB, which is uh an, which is another al- alternative. Jellyfin is just a little bit better because yeah. you know, Jellyfin is still open source. But yeah, and because I'm I, I have to ask you a question. Yes. Do you know what language Jellyfin is written in? I believe it is some form of the C C variety, and yes. it might it might be might be a little dot netish. Yeah. Hmm. 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 Yeah, it's written in C sharp. Oh, what do you know? What do you know? Just I like I knew. MB was before. Yep. But hey, it it is performant. Uh, and then uh, at least I've always found it performant. I've never had to deal yeah, with it lagging. Of course. And of course, unlike Plex. The download button actually works, <laughs> <laughs> and there's a huge variety of community plugins. So uh, it, so just like Plex, you can you can plug in like your YouTube integrations to Jellyfin. So like your Jellyfin server can connect to YouTube or Netflix or I believe that there's even an Amazon Prime Video plugin for that you can get working on it, which I know you can't get working on Cody right now. <laughs> and uh, it's actually very, 
very exciting to to uh, see that Co- Cody's actually been getting a lot better lately as well, and I'm glad to see that that like the the uh like the the popular community, you know, like like uh the jellyfin just like really come around towards like th- them as well so like the people that are just running like their true nas their true nas systems and they're just going into like the application directory and just like double click double clicking installing uh, jellyfin instead of plex nice so I- i'm glad i'm glad to see that that's growing which that that just brings more eyes to the project and bringing more eyes to a free and open source <coughs> project is always a good thing it's yep. never a bad thing it- yep yep but anyways, uh, I think that's most of the show. Mm, so yeah. let's get back to the topic of Kubernetes and Maslon. So I cannot tell you how much it is using because as a genius, damn, I forgot to enable Matrix API. Oh my goodness. But I did access each of the, cl- each of the nodes in the cluster and I can tell you rough nodes on how much it is like i cannot sh- i will not share what else is running on it but the rough notes are each of the notes first of all is using or it has two cores and eight gigs of ram and okay. generally they sit on something like 10 percent of both cores and between two and four gigabytes of ram used with one node uh, sitting at two percent of uh, of the CPU use, so it's not that bad, especially for an overkill solution such as mine. Okay, so not bad at all. Yep. But anyways, uh, guys, if you would like to send us feedback and tell Big Pod how to enable that metrics API. Uh, you can send. You can always send us an angry email. We actually got an angry email a few weeks ago that told us that our YouTube channel, that our YouTube videos were were kind of messed up. Hey, thanks for doing that, bud. Uh, so uh, we we got that. That was the first bit of feedback that we got in a hot minute. Yeah. And you know, I I I always really appreciate getting feedback. So hey, send us an email. Uh, if you would like to support our productions. We have a Patreon page. I actually remember to put it in the show notes this week, Big Pod, just to let you know. Really? I should, pro- nice. I should probably put in the Git template, shouldn't I? <laughs> but hey, if you go to patreon.com slash no tucks allowed, you can go there, you can give us a couple of dollars. Uh, that gives you access to a pre- more premium audio audio feed because I know that, there, that some people don't realize that we record and publish this at 120 kilobits. Yeah, I I know, I know. It's a travesty. It's a travesty. Uh, uh you would be wrong. It's ninety six kilobits. The it's original 96. one. It's ninety six. It's ninety six. It's even lower. Yeah. But you know, did you know that some podcast, some big big podcast, Joe Rogan, publishes their podcast at seventy two? Probably. We're already a higher quality production. <laughs> Technically speaking, <laughs> technically, technically speaking, speaking. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, if you if if uh, you live that audiophile lifestyle, give us five dollars. That's the cheapest piece of audiophile equipment that you could possibly buy, and you will get three hundred twenty kilobits. Yep, I promise. If you don't know what we're even talking about, give us five dollars anyway because you because you just love our jokes. Uh, what? We have a YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash n- at no tux allowed. Uh, of course, uh, you can go subscri- subscribe to us there. Uh, get Drop us comments every now and then on the channel. Help that channel grow because the more that channel grows, the more we can send people to our to our one source, source of truth, our universal source of truth, where if you don't know where to get the show, you can always go to show.tuxspace.com slash at NTA. That is the show's official website. Yeah, because we self-host our entire podcast. Be- because that gives us powers to say whatever we want. If you're pulling, uh, the majority of our listeners pull in this podcast through aggregators, and I completely understand that. It just makes it super easy. You go into your iTunes app store, you type in uh, "tech podcast no tucks allowed." I understand that. 
But, you know, there comes a certain power when it comes to self-hosting because we control it. Of course, because we control it, we also have to pay for it. That's why we have the Patreon link. Uh, but we also have a Discord community because uh, sometimes I know that people don't want to send us emails. Uh, I remember to put the link for that in the show notes. Uh, it should just also be in the Git template because I copy the show notes off the Git template every week, but I keep forgetting to update it. <laughs> Or if you want to shout at us directly, you can go to these links that are showing up on the screen right now. Big Pod, you probably still need to fix yours. Just uh, saying this right now. Uh, yeah. But hey, uh, these are federated links to our individual Fediverse accounts. Of course, we also have YouTube channels as well. Uh, YouTube.com slash at 10 Lee J is myself. And then we have at Big Pod for Big Pod. Uh, I have a video in the editing pipeline. Trust me. It'll come out eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if Big Pod's that far yet. <laughs> no, definitely okay. not. Okay, so I promise you guys, I'm uploading things because you know uh, I'm done. I'm done dealing with tornado bullshit. Because <laughs> 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 honestly, at this point, it's just bullshit. <laughs> Self-hosted podcast. I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And I think. I will see you next week. I'll see you next week as well.